Oh, hello! Welcome back to Speakeasy. I am still Paul F. Tompkins, and you will recognize my next guest from his turns on Arrested Development and currently on the HBO series Veep. Please say hello to Tony Hale. Hello! Tony, you we're gonna mimic God! Yeah! Kapow! Uh. Bing. <laughs> uh, Tony, welcome. Thank Let's you. Let's enjoy a little bit of a drink together. Yes, Thank yes, you for yes. being here. Oh my gosh, my pleasure. Absolutely delightful. Delightful. Now this is your request. Thank you very much for requesting such a yeah, lovely Yeah, because I, I kind of have a little bit of a, a sweet tooth. I like the desserts. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll, I see all these really sweet drinks and I, they're like Kool-Aid. I can just kind of... But this has a little bit of sweet, so it's not... I won't right. like go crazy on it. But you need enough alcohol in there to remind I need, you <laughs> I need what's going on. I need 75% alcohol. Yes. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit grapefruit. Arrested Development, coming back from the grave. In May, yeah. Courtesy of Netflix. Yeah, thank you, Netflix. When you first started hearing about, uh, you know, web content and streaming and things like that and original programming mm. on these things that are not quite television, right? it kind of seemed like, well, I'll believe it when I see it that that's going to be a thing. But in very short order, this is really happening. Yeah, and they had talked about it for a while. Like they, I remember when we finished, they were like, we want to do a movie, we, wanted, we want to do more stuff. So it was always kind of maybe happening, but then after a while we were like, I don't know. I don't know if it's yeah. going to happen. And then, you know, the past year and a half it just started going. And so it was very exciting. Yeah. I mean, crazy. I mean, and surreal because it was kind of like a time warp when we got on set because, you know, it had been seven years since we finished. Mm -hmm. And so then we're all kind of in costume and looking around and it's just, it was just, it was like it never changed. What, where, did, where does all that stuff go when a show goes off the They air? rebuilt it. They totally rebuilt. From scratch. Yeah. Wow. They rebuilt. I think there was probably some things they might have stored, but I remember when we finished the show, at that time we didn't know if we were going to be done. Like there was a, there was a possibility we might be going to a, another place or something like that. So we didn't know. I would have liked to kind of grab memorabilia or mm -hmm. something. Um, so we didn't get anything. But then they had this auction, I remember, and they sold everything. Did you buy anything at auction? No, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I should have, no. Now that I think about it. But I remember they, they had to rebuild my hook and, you know, all this right. stuff. But it was, the whole thing was just crazy and fun and surreal. And I mean, the whole time we were just looking around going, wow, I can't believe this is happening. Did you guys, were you snapped right back into it? Or did it, did it take a little while to shake some rust off? Or I will say, like, Buster, he's so um, completely emasculated. And he's he's always he's always on the defense. Like he's always just like oh, oh. Yeah. And he's, to the point where he's just practically backing up just from defensiveness. Yeah. So it kind of took a while to kind of get back into that. The specificity of the physicality of yeah, Buster. just kind of him being so. I mean, I consider myself a sensitive, vulnerable guy, but he was just like completely void of any masculinity. And I remember my wife when I was shooting the show, I would you know be doing Buster all day, and I'd come home. And she was like, you're a little hypersensitive. Let's just, like, let's bring Tony back a little bit. Because anything she'd say, I'd be like, oh, what's what, wrong? <laughs> like, I was just so, you know, in that character so much. Like but... muscle memory. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. could <laughs> like, chill out. Couldn't help but rear back yeah, at yeah. the smallest things. I'm just asking for a drink. Just chill <laughs> out. The idea of the movie, could you see a way that that would have worked in a satisfying way? Because that's a tall order to not only bring something back after... Um, such a long time, yeah. but then also to adapt it to a really a very different medium. The thing is, what Mitch, who created Mitch Hurwitz, Mitch Hurwitz. Who created the show, he's got such a mat a comic matrix in his mind, mm -hmm. and it's, I, I mean, I, he can come up with anything, mm -hmm. you know. And I remember when we were doing this show, you know, we're doing kind of doing these scripts, and I'm reading them. I'm not really getting what's going on, and. You know, we're just kind of trusting his vision, and I know it's going to come out great, but it's, he's just got, it just works, it just works in his head, so a movie would have worked, the episodes would have worked, like, right. to this day, I genuinely don't really know what's going on in the show, and so I'm kind of interested to see how he puts it all together, because he's just, he, he's just such a master at it. But you, know? you <laughs> once it's done, then you see it. Yeah. And you're like, that's why he had me do that. Yeah, what I remember it? the day when he came up to me and he was like, yeah, we're thinking about, like, a seal biting off your hand. And I remember thinking, oh, that sucks. Like, I like to use my hands. <laughs> I mean, that really sucks. But then you just kind of trust him because it's just you know, a possibility for so right. many comic things and it worked out great. And actually he had thought about that because in the show, which I, to this day, um, I'll see things where there's like symbols of hands Mm -hmm. Way before my hand came off, so he knew that hand was coming off. Right. You know, w way before. 
Arrested Development is full of clues, there's callbacks, there's there's all this sort of uh, a tapestry-like, you know, weaving right. together of all these disparate right. uh, uh, moments and references and everything. Of course, there's no shortage of discussion about it mm -hmm. online. Um, do you ever check that stuff out? I actually catch things that people will say. Mm -hmm. um, like, for instance, the hand thing, I, I was seeing something online on Twitter and somebody had said, oh, I just discovered this and Jeffrey Tambor was wearing a jacket in this episode and he had a little hand pen on. And I was like, never saw that. Right. Never saw that. And that happens all the time. I'm like, nope, never saw that. Right. People are like, wasn't that crazy? I'm, no, don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, I never caught it. Right. You know, so stuff like that, I love catching that stuff. Did you rewatch the whole series before getting back into it? Yeah, my wife and I watched watched again just to kind of get back into it. And I actually hadn't seen it for a while. Mm -hmm. As you know, when you shoot something and you're so close to it, you know, you're watching it kind of with different eyes a little bit. Yeah. And then time passes and you watch it again and you're like, that was really a fun yeah. <laughs> show, yeah. you know? So it's like, it was neat to see it with new eyes and just be like, wow, this stuff is really fun. Are you okay watching yourself on screen typically? <laughs> uh... I think you get better at it. Yeah. I think you get better at it. I mean, th th we all have had that when you first watch it and you're like, oh my God, I sound like that? Come on, why Why has no, someone not stopped me? Um, but and you just kind of totally analyze yourself. I think the, the more I see it, the, the easier it, it gets, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's the big difference between film and television, that film you got probably one shot at mm -hmm. this character, you know, that's gonna be a 90 minute story. With television, I mean, obviously, I'm sure watching the series again, watching Arrested Development again, you probably saw an evolution mm. of Buster mm -hmm. in your performance, right? Yeah, and he got crazier. Yeah. You know, he started off kind of innocent and, and sweet and vulnerable and obviously very sheltered. But then when things are added to the script, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Liza Minnelli's my girlfriend, Lucille too, and, all these kind of things are added, the hand comes off. You just begin to kind of adapt to that kind of path. Did you feel that your performance uh, got less inhibited over time? When you're doing something and you can kind of get to that place where you're kind of comfortable and free, then it's just, I don't know, it's just kind of like riding a wave, it's just yeah. fun. My challenge was always to just, even though Buster was out there, just to kind of ground him. And I remember Mitch, Hurwitz talking to Mitch about that, he said something I never forgot. He said, all Buster wanted in life was safety. Mm -hmm. That's all he wanted. So anything that came against that, he would spiral. Right. You know, so it was a really nice uh, bit just to always remember of like, okay, this is threatening my safety. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spiral or I'm, gonna, I'm craving for anything to give me safety, mm -hmm. whether it's my mother, whether it's Lucille too, Liza Minnelli, or just something, whether it's, I even had a relationship with a Roomba, <laughs> a vacuum cleaner. Right. Being a part of something like this, a cult phenomenon, like it has a, a, a very fervent uh, uh, following. So with that comes a, uh, a very specific type of fame. Mm -hmm. um, when you started out as an actor, was that something that you craved? Or mm. is it something that uh, sort of, like the desire for that fades over time? And Yeah, I love that question. I remember when I was in New York uh, and I was doing kind of commercials and cater waiters. You were there for was, 10 years, I was right? there for yeah. uh, about eight years, yeah. And, um, I apologize. <laughs> Paul, let's get our facts straight. <laughs> um, and I remember thinking like, oh, that sitcom's coming. Like that sitcom, it, it's coming, it's coming. And when I got it, I mean, I won't say it was a depression, but you kind of go through a disappointment because it can't, it, that fame or that thing didn't satisfy the way you thought it was gonna satisfy. Mm -hmm. And it was a massive lesson of, if you're not practicing contentment where you're at, you're not gonna be content when you get what you want. All that whole time in New York, I was so far into that's coming. And it could be anything for anybody. It you're could living be, on expectation. You're living on expectation. It could be anything. It could be like getting that show. It could be having a baby. It could be getting married, whatever. It's like that thing. But if you're not practicing that contentment where you're at, I promise you, you're not gonna be content when you get it. You're in a business, and I think this is probably true of, of all types of jobs. It's not just creative jobs, right. but you're, you're, you're sort of conditioned to think you have to keep moving up whatever ladder it is you're yeah. supposed to be moving up. Yeah. And if you're not always doing that, yeah. th whatever rung you're on is not good enough. It's you not, know, Even not. though you could have all kinds of success and everything's going great and yeah. you have a job that you love sure. and you, know, you have a great life at sure. home and all that, yeah. but it's still like, well, because I'm not doing that, 
you, you might not even want to do that thing, but you're sort of, oh, no. you become conditioned to think that you do. And it really takes you away from that, you know, present thing, mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, also, I mean, to be honest, like this business, so much of this business is based in fear. You know, people who don't have the gig they want, they're afraid they're not gonna get it. The people that have the gig, they're afraid they're gonna lose it. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking from a place of like, <laughs> I mean, I struggle with this. It's almost like somebody saying to me, you, you wake yourself up a hundred times a day, mm -hmm. where it's like, I'm gonna wake myself up to the present and not be so into, I gotta get to that next rung in the ladder. Yeah. I gotta get, because this is clearly not working, I gotta get there. It's like, no, I gotta wake myself up. I'm having a conversation with a lovely greyhound with Paul right. F. Tompkins. That's right. You know, it's like, but it's like, I have to do that. Yeah. I have to wake myself up. Yeah. And by the way, thank you for uh, acknowledging my nickname, the lovely greyhound. Oh, I did not know that was your nickname, well, Paul F. Duncan. It gets around. <laughs> All of a sudden, we turned into an Oprah interview, <laughs> which I love. Love that, love that stuff. Enjoy your cars. <laughs> You're uh, welcome. <laughs> so now on to uh, your current gig on Veep. Yeah. Julia Louis-Dreyfus plays the vice president. Uh, mm -hmm. You play Gary, who is her, what, what is his title officially? Gary is her, um, what's called body man. Mm -hmm. So I carry around this large bag, and if she needs anything, then I will have it, and I'll kind of hand her her schedule or her folders or anything like that, or her speech. There's a lot of different pockets in this bag, because Gary is very organized, and he knows exactly where these pockets are. and. He takes better care of his bag than most people do their dog. Gary lives to be there and be ready. I live f for her. Yeah. Most people who are body men to politicians, it's in their 20s and they're, you know, it's like two and three years of craziness because they have no life and, right. and then they realize like, I gotta get out of here. No, not Gary. Gary has stayed into his 40s right. and um, he can't imagine life without her uh -huh. and he will never leave her. I mean, right. it, literally if she goes and works at J. Crew. he will be right by her side. <laughs> Have you ever had a relationship that felt like that? Where somebody... Where you sort of lived through the other person, that it was all about them? I think about high school, I think, oh. you know, I became all things to all people just to, you know... To survive. Just survive. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, you want me to be punk? I'll be punk. Right. Oh, chorus crowd? I'm in. Right. You know, I'll learn the oboe or whatever. It's like, your identity, you don't know who you are, and it's like, oh, I'll become your, I'll become that. I'll who become would that. like to like me? Yeah, exactly. Anyone? Oh, all? Yeah. Great. Oh, none of you? I'll make you. This is uh, obviously a show that satirizes politics. Mm -hmm. Are you very political yourself? Do you follow politics closely? Um, good question. I, I get kind of overwhelmed by politics, mm -hmm. and I, I subscribe to a magazine called The Week. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. heard of it. I've heard of it. And it kind of gives a Cliff Notes version of what's going on, because CNN, all that kind of stuff, it just, it's too much for me. No, it is a know? bit of an assault. There's all these different perspectives, and especially with the internet that, right. <laughs> yeah. with, with your email forwards, yeah. uh, you might get skewed ideas of what's going on in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, with our show and with politics in, general, politics in general, you're kind of always putting your best foot forward. They're always, you know, best smile, best sound bite, all this kind of stuff. And the fact is, you know these people have to freak out behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Like they've got to lose it because nobody can be a container for that much pressure. It's, it's sort of amazing that we don't hear more about those freakouts. But when, the thing is, we're a very judgmental society because when we do, we're like, oh, how could they? Because they're human. Yeah. I would be surprised if they didn't. And I'd be like, are we, is our is a robot our, you know, it's like, they gotta have those moments. By the way, I, I hope that we live to see the day when a robots are present. I have our first, can you imagine? That would be amazing. Oh. Oh, please. Hologram, <laughs> they could be in our house every day. Oh, I draw oh, the line oh, there. Okay. We're no not more. ready. <laughs> we're, I don't we're think not, we're ready. But we're ready. ready for a robot. I think so. Okay. Yeah, the, the wheel turns slowly, but it turns. <laughs> it does. Um, do you feel that it makes you uh, less judgmental of somebody that you, before doing the show, maybe you would have been more judgmental of and written off as a dishonest person or? Absolutely. I remember I was doing this this little movie years ago, and I was playing this guy who was just kind of, I just did not like this guy. He mm -hmm. was like, just manipulative and kind of a little bit of a player, and it was just, just a douchebag. And I was like, I don't wanna play this guy. Anyways, I went to this fantastic coach in LA, and I was talking to her about it. Her whole thing is like, Tony, that's y you. Like, cause the fact is, that's inside of me. And that's where you get to the truth of these people. And it's that whole thing of like, I'm you, I'm you, I mean, like, that's inside of me. And it helps with that, kind of that whole acting thing of like, it takes that judgment out. Does it ever lead to self-judgment though, if you're touching on negative parts of yourself and realizing this is, this is a thing that's in me, or are you able to 
see it from a distance and say, this is just part of being a human being. It's funny because even they say sometimes in acting, it's, it's more difficult to play joy than it is difficult to play sorrow or play anger because that stuff is very easily tapped into. This is why we need the robot president. And this is why we need the robot president. He has no emotion. You and I shared the silver screen in The Informant. Yes, we did. With Mr. Matt Damon. Yes, Oscar we winner did. Matt Damon. Yes. Do you remember, it was between takes, an assistant came over and placed in front of Matt Damon a bowl of bright blue liquid, and in that bright blue liquid was a, a smaller bowl that had clear gelatinous cubes in it, and he put them in his mouth. What's happening? <laughs> this is totally missed exactly. This. I, I completely. Wait, was this the when we were at the boardroom? Yeah. You were sitting across from yeah. us, correct? Yes. A, a bowl with blue and was it gel? Was it was like a. It gel was like a gelatinous cube. What's happening? An opaque gelatinous cube. What's happening? I, f I found did you out ask? later. Oh, okay. You oh, of asked. course I did okay. not ask. I was terrified. Okay, right. I did not. I thought I was seeing. Damn secret, it! What's up with the blue cube? I thought I was seeing secret Hollywood Illuminati stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he had put on weight for the role, and oh. this was towards the end of filming, so he was losing the weight. This was part of a cleanse. Really? But now the most disturbing part, when I heard that he put on weight for the role, it was like, he's still thinner than me. <laughs> hmm. That's him, that's him like letting himself go. Oh God, guess who I'm <laughs> never gonna take my shirt off. Yeah, of. yeah, he's probably, I think, you know, what, your pants are a 32 now? Oh God. You big fat so? Wait, I still don't understand the blue uh, cube situation. I the the blue liquid I don't understand. Oh, so the blue at all. liquid, and then what and then you said? a little ramekin floating in the blue liquid. What's happening? With these little gelatinous cubes. And he drank the whole bowl. No, no. He plucked the cubes out, put them in his mouth. What? Like it's okay. a thing everyone does all the time. Guess who's gonna be on Google when I get home trying to find out what this is? That's fascinating. Cut to Tony on the streets of L.A. With cubes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I need my uh, cube juice. My cube juice. Now I feel like maybe I'm the only one that saw it and it didn't actually happen. <laughs> you see Matt Damon again. It's like, <laughs> what was up with the cubes? What's up with you, Paul? I never drank cubes. But, and then I disappear. <laughs> okay, good. I'm, uh, my name is erased from history. <laughs> he has that power. Tony Hale, what yes. a pleasure to chat with you over oh, a great night. Thank you for being here. That is Huge it for this. Pleasure. Oh, shit. I am so Tony, sorry, it's back. don't you apologize. It's gonna do You're a guest. Well, that's it for this round of Speakeasy. Join me again next time when my guest will be someone else. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and check back every Monday to see who I interview next. And for more info about Speakeasy, visit MadeMan.com.